Welcome to the second video on ancient Rome and part one of the Roman Legion. The Roman Legion was one of the most splendid military units the world has ever seen. But it went through several important phases and we are going to cover all of those phases in the next series of videos dealing with the Roman Legion. Now, as I said, the Legion varied over time, but it can be broken down into five distinct periods. And even those periods can be broken into further subdivisions, which we will cover in the next several videos dealing with the Roman Legion. Now, in this video, we'll be covering the Regal Era Legions, and the Regal Era Legions lasted approximately from 600 B.C. to 509 B.C. And, of course, 509 B.C. represents the start of the Roman Republic. And the early to mid-Roman Republican legions lasted from approximately 509 B.C. to 107 B.C. And so we will cover these two epochs in this video. In the next video, we will cover the late Republican legions along with the Imperial legions. And then in the third video on the Roman legion, we'll talk about the Roman camp and the Roman command structure. Now, in the earliest times... That is a time period that existed before and into the early regal period. There was no Roman army in the conventional sense. These were more like war bands that conducted small-scale raiding against other clans and neighboring hilltop cities. So there really was no Roman legion as we know it today. Eventually, more emphasis was placed on a military organization and the legion was formed. The earliest descriptions we have occurred between 600 and 550 B.C., and that was the first regal legion that was described by ancient historians. We call these regal legions because this was the time of the Roman kings. So the legion answered only to the king, and of course the king was the commander of the army. Now there were three ancient tribes in the earliest recorded epochs of Roman history, and each tribe was expected to provide 1,000 infantry. Each unit of this 1,000 infantry were commanded by a tribune, which is kind of like a modern-day colonel. In turn, the thousand-man unit was also divided into a century of a hundred infantry. So there were ten centuries for each one thousand infantry. And of course, century as we know it today equals a hundred. Now that unit of one hundred infantry was under the command of a centurion, and that equates to the modern-day rank of captain. There were also 300 cavalry that were attached to the early Roman legion. Now, you'll see right there hoplite, and now you might be wondering, what were hoplites doing in the Roman legion? Weren't those part of the Greek phalanx? Well, the answer to that is, the Greeks began to colonize southern Italy, and what happened is the Greeks brought their style of government, which of course was the Greek polis, or city-state. And as the various Italian tribes came into contact with the Greeks, they borrowed that form of government. So Rome owes a lot to the Greeks. The Greek polis was used to organize many of the early cities in Italy. And so it was only natural that the Romans would have adopted the Greek phalanx. And with that came hoplites. And of course, as we know, the hoplite had these long spears. And of course, they were organized in close cohesion together and so the legion looked more and more like a phalanx rather than the legion as we know it today. And of course, what did hoplites use as their primary weapon? The spear. And so that was the primary weapon of the early Roman legions. Now, the Roman army consisted of a single royal legion of about 3,000 hoplites. So the hoplite represented the heavy infantry of the early Roman legion. And they were also complemented, as I said, by 300 cavalry and also some light unarmored infantry. And we'll get into that in a few slides. What's also similar to the Greek phalanx is the Roman legion consisted of the land-owning farmers. So that's very, very similar to the Greek phalanx that also consisted of farmers. Now, the next regal legion that we know of was called the Servian Legion, and that was organized by the Roman king, Servius Tullius, who you see there on the right. Now, the Servian Legion underwent some changes. The amount of centuries were doubled to 60, and so that increased the size of the legion 
to 6,000 hoplites. It was still considered a single legion, but that doubled the size of the Roman army. They also organized the unarmored infantry, and this unit of the Roman legion was called the velites, and as I said, they were the unarmored infantry. So this was different than the early Greek phalanx that consisted only of heavy infantry. So the Romans have added something a little bit different here. Also, the size of the cavalry was doubled to 600, but the cavalry during these times was unarmored because heavy armored cavalry was not used by the Romans to much later on. And so, with the 6,000 hoplites, along with the 2,400 velites and the 600 cavalry, that brings a total of 9,000 men in the single royal legion. And as I mentioned before, these were under the command of the Roman king. Okay, so let's move on to the legions of the Roman Republic. And actually, this is the early to mid-Roman Republic. The late Roman Republic we will cover in the next video. Now, the characteristics of a Roman soldier during the Roman Republic, and actually I should point out that these attributes were also probably present during the Regal period. And those characteristics involved a love of Rome and absolute loyalty to Rome. So all individual aspirations were suppressed in favor of the Roman state. So no matter what the situation, Roman soldiers and generals always stayed loyal to Rome. And this is a little bit different than the Greek generals. If you've watched some of my Greek series, you'll notice that leaders like Alcibiades and Demaratus, when they are exiled, they always seem to switch sides. That is not the case for Roman soldiers, and especially Roman generals. If they were exiled or banished, they accepted their punishment. They never went to the other side. And the other characteristic of the Roman soldier was discipline. And I think only the Spartans approached the level of discipline that the Roman army achieved. And this really sets them apart from anything on the Italian peninsula. This fighting spirit and patriotism lasted for centuries and made Rome ultimately what it came to be. Now, I should also point out that these were not year-round standing professional armies. That that is, these armies were raised in times of need, or if there was a major crisis. But recruiting soldiers was not a problem, because to serve in the army was considered a privilege rather than a duty. These were citizen soldiers from the wealthy classes, and that's something that's very similar to the early Greek hoplite. Now, after the Roman kings were tossed out, and the Roman Republic was founded in 509 BC, the Romans created the office of the consul. And they created two consuls. And the reason this was done was so that no one man had complete power over Rome. And they also limited the term to one year. And then a new consul was elected. Now in terms of the legion, the consul replaced the king as the commander of the legion. And since there were two consuls, each consul was assigned a single legion. So they basically took that single royal legion that I talked about in the last slide and divided it into two one for each consul. And so each legion consisted of 3,000 hoplites instead of the 6,000 that we talked about just a moment ago. And the velites and cavalry were also split equally. So there were now 1,200 velites and 300 cavalry assigned to each consular legion. And so each legion had a grand total of 4,500 men. And this remained the normal size of the Republican legion almost to the end of the Republic and right up to the start of the Roman Empire. Now let's talk about a few more tidbits here about the typical Roman soldier. The age of the Roman soldier was between 17 and 45. Now after 45, the veterans were usually placed in city defenses and garrisons. And so if a city was attacked, they would be called upon to defend the city. Now the Roman soldier was not tall because obviously people in those days were a lot shorter. The average height was around five foot to five foot three. But the Romans believed the shorter the better. They placed less of an emphasis on height and believed it was far more important to be strongly built. So even though the average height was less than five foot three, a lot of times the Roman soldier weighed between 160 and 190 pounds. So these were very well-built men. Now I can imagine the Gauls, who were much taller than the average Roman, sometimes up to six feet tall, must have laughed at these puny Romans. It was only when they got into close quarters against the Romans did they find out how difficult it was to defeat the Roman soldier. And the Roman soldier more than held his own against all of the barbarian hordes 
in northern Italy. Now we also see the Romans starting to shorten the spear, and this results in more of an emphasis on close quarter fighting. So the Romans are gradually moving away from the Greek-styled phalanx, which emphasizes the spear, and placing more emphasis on the sword. And we will get to that in the next few slides. Okay, so now we come to one of the major changes in the history of the Roman legion. And this occurred roughly halfway through the Republican era of Rome. Now, as mentioned before, the Roman legions initially used the concept of the Greek phalanx for their battle formations. And so all of the heavy infantry was placed in a tight square or rectangular box. And this was all the way across the line. And so there really was no concept of reserves. Once the phalanx was set in motion, it could only go one direction, and that was forward. So the Romans created a three-line system, which we will get to in a minute. So while the Greeks stuck with their one-shock idea, the Romans wanted to give each man more individual scope and provide for more of an attacking style rather than a defensive-themed phalanx. This was called a manipular structure. And so the Romans took the phalanx and split it up into all these individual segments called maniples, which you can see right here. The maniple allowed for greater flexibility and effectiveness, especially in the mountainous interior of central Italy. Now, if you watch my video on the Greek phalanx, you will remember that the phalanx did not do well in uneven terrain. It was far more effective on flat, open planes. That's because the phalanx was a close order formation where everybody's packed in tightly and so uneven terrain tended to break up this close cohesion. Now that would not be a problem for the Roman maniple because it was an open order formation. Now the reason the Romans switched to the maniple was because of an ancient feud with a warlike tribe called the Samnites. The Samnites were from central Italy and they hammered the Romans in several battles. So what is that cliche? If you can't beat it, join it. Or in this case, copy it. So that is essentially what the Romans did here. They took the structure of the maniple that the Samnites were using and adapted and improvised it for themselves. Now this is very different from the Spartans. You will remember when I did that video on the Spartans, I talked about how they were unwilling to change. Well, the Romans were always willing to toss something out if it wasn't working. And this led to the success that they ultimately had. So again, this is a shift from a close order formation to an open order. And this also meant that Romans from this point on would always take the initiative. Romans go on the attack, they don't wait for the enemy to approach them. And because of that, the sword would become the primary weapon. Now, as I said, they set up a three-line system of heavy infantry. The best were in the rear, and the least good were in front. And there were intervals between the lines. These gaps, as you can see here, were very important to the Roman battle tactics, and we will get to those in a moment. Now, the light troops remained as they were. This was essentially a change with the heavy infantry and making it into three different lines. So let's talk about the maniple for a minute. The Romans deployed these into a series of small tactical units. And as I said, they were arranged in three lines. And as you can see, it's in kind of a chessboard type of pattern where they alternate each maniple. Now you remember a few slides ago, I said that the earlier legions were organized into units of 100 men each called sentries. And that kind of stayed the same. They were just called maniples now. The only difference was they were separated by gaps now. They weren't all standing together. So the maniples again were basically the old century. Now there were 20 maniples in each of the three lines that a legion was drawn up in for battle. The first line was called the Hastati, the second line was called the Principe, and the third line of heavy infantry was called the Triari. So the total of all three of these lines was 60 maniples. That is, there was 60 maniples of heavy infantry in each legion. The maniples of the front two lines contained twice as many men as those in the rear line. There were 120 men to each maniple in the first two lines, and the rear line contained 60 men. Each maniple was still commanded by a centurion, and there was also a junior centurion that also commanded the maniple. Now, within the maniple itself, the individual Roman soldier also had more room. They had a six by six foot fighting square around them, and this gave soldiers ample space to fight with their swords. Now this would have been impossible in the densely packed phalanx. Now the Romans still kept the velites, 
They were right here out in front of the three lines of heavy infantry. Now the Velite never engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Their job was to disrupt the enemy lines before the battle began in earnest. And so they would toss their pilum, which was essentially a heavy javelin, and then disengage and fall through the intervals. And as you can see here, they would fall through these gaps. And that chessboard arrangement allowed them to easily accomplish that. Now the Velites did not wear armor. But they did carry a wooden shield, and of course, as I mentioned, they had javelins to toss at the enemy. Now let's talk about the first line of heavy infantry called the Hastadi. The Hastadi were closest to the enemy with the other two lines behind them. They also had a heavy javelin, which they could toss at the enemy, but their main attack weapon was with the famed Gladius, which became the default sword of the Roman legion. And we will talk about equipment in the next slide. Now, the Hastadi consisted of the youngest soldiers. Now, a lot of times, the Hastadi themselves could defeat an enemy, but if they couldn't defeat the enemy, then like the Velites, they would retreat through the gap and the enemy would run into the next heavy infantry line, the Principe. And these were generally men in the prime of their lives. They were older than the soldiers in the Hastati, and they were also wealthier, so they could afford better equipment. They carried large shields and wore good quality armor. Now, if they had to retreat through the gaps, the enemy encountered the final line, the Triari. Now, they were also equipped with a thrusting spear and gladius, but they used a different javelin than the first two lines. So they didn't use the pilum, they used an older type of spear. Now as I said, in most battles, the first two lines proved superior to anything the enemy could deploy. And the Romans were typically able to destroy the enemy's center without having to use their third line of defense. So many times the triari just sat around and were not even engaged in the battle. And they could either go on the attack or they could cover a retreat if that order had been given. They were the oldest and among the wealthiest men in the army. And therefore they could afford the best equipment. They wore heavy metal armor and carried large shields, and they were meant to be used as the decisive force in a battle if they were called upon. Thus, there was an old Roman saying, going to the triari, which meant carrying on the battle to the bitter end. Now, there were some other major changes around this time. The demands of the struggle with the Samnites led to the doubling of the normal Roman military machine. Four legions were created instead of two. So now each Roman consul had two legions under his wing. Also, Roman allies were required to supply troops. So this quadrupled the size of the normal consular army from 5,000 soldiers to 20,000. Now, I should point out that what this system of reserves did for the Romans is it allowed the consul to deploy reserves where he needed them. Them. So if one line was failing or one side of the formation was failing, he could deploy the reserves as need be. And I should also point out that the commander of the legion was always behind the line. And this was very different than the Greeks. The Greek commander was always out in front leading the charge. And so that required a lot of careful pre-planning by the Greek commander because once everything started, he was engaged in the fight himself and he really didn't have the ability to make battlefield decisions like his Roman counterparts could. And so that's a big advantage for the Romans. So generals like Julius Caesar, they always command from behind the line, whereas generals like Alexander the Great always lead the charge. Now we were gonna get into equipment and the specialized units, but this video is starting to run longer than I expected. So we will get into that in the next video.